as we start this second session, I want to prepare our hearts by leading us into a time of prayer specifically for spiritual and physical needs in Iran. So whether you're on your own right now or you're with others and you can get in a group of two or three or four people, in just a moment, you're going to see some prayer points on the screen. And I want to invite you just to read them to yourselves and then start praying out loud accordingly, either on your own or in your group, just kind of going around uh, to the extent of which you feel comfortable. And we're going to spend the next eight or so minutes praying, and then I'm going to close us in prayer. But let's intercede right now before God for spiritual and physical needs in Iran. Go for it.
Oh God, we pray, we ask, we intercede in all these ways for the nation, for the people of Iran. And we're about to read in your word, I called and you answered. So we pray, answer our prayers. We ask you to do according to your word what we've just asked you to do for your glory in Iran and for the good of people in Iran. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you ready for Jonah 2? We left off with Jonah hurled into the sea. Presumably to his death, the wind and the waves, now quiet, sailors from the nations are worshiping the Lord. But in verse 17 of Jonah 1, or as I mentioned, there's a bit of disagreement on this because the Hebrew Bible actually has this as the first verse in chapter 2 because the scene totally shifts to the water where Jonah is apparently not dead. So just imagine being in Jonah's shoes now. You hit the water with a splash and are suddenly immersed in waves as they pour over you. We don't know if Jonah was able to swim. It's certainly possible that he wasn't. But regardless, at some point, a panic sets in. And before long, you find yourself struggling to stay afloat and gasping for breath as you ultimately sink into what is starting to feel like a calm, quiet tomb of water all around you. Until verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Well, that's quite a verse. The Lord, Yahweh, appointed, provided. So just note that word, maybe circle it, underline it, because we're going to see it more in the future. A great fish. Let's pause there. We're not told what type of fish this was or really any details about the fish, like I mentioned at the start. It may be the main character this book is known for, apart from Jonah, but it's only mentioned almost in passing in three verses, which seems kind of strange to us, right? Because we're all thinking, uh, what? A uh, fish swallowed Jonah and kept it at its belly for three days? Like a little more explanation, please. We, we now have this picture of a man inside a digestive tract of fish intestines and fat and blubber and waste which leads to all kinds of questions about what type of fish this is or how this would be humanly possible for a man to survive in a fish for three days. But here's the deal. The author of Jonah doesn't seem too focused on answering our questions. The Lord is clearly in control of this scene, including this fish that he's appointed. And the author is not trying to give us further explanation. The author accepts this is clearly a miracle. In other words, this doesn't happen every day. This is a divine act beyond human replication or explanation. So we don't need to try to explain it or imagine how to replicate it. If it happens to you and you suddenly find yourself inside an aquatic animal, that should be your first clue that things are not in your control at that moment. And prayer would probably be a good option for you also. So God in his word is not as interested as we are in the drama that's playing out in a fish's belly. God is interested in the drama that's playing out in Jonah's heart. And besides, think about it. God obviously could have brought Jonah back to shore another way, right? God could have provided a piece of cargo or floating wreckage that had been thrown overboard or a a million other things to which Jonah could have held on to until he eventually washed up on the beach. Instead, God appoints a fish who swallows him. So circle that word because we're starting to get a clue behind why God chose this way to save Jonah. When we see this word that's used other times in the Bible, specifically to describe judgment. Look at Psalm chapter 21, verses 8 and 9 with me. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. So this picture of a fish swallowing Jonah seems like a picture of God's judgment. At the same time, this fish is keeping Jonah alive. So it also seems like a picture of God's salvation, 
Remember in the last chapter, we talked about God's mercy sometimes seeming severe. The way we might describe this, and you might write it down, is salvation through judgment. So the picture here is God is showing judgment. At the same time, he's showing salvation. Salvation through judgment. And that's a pretty common theme all throughout the Bible. So just one quick example from Deuteronomy chapter 4. As God's people were preparing to enter into the promised land, he says to them, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. So that's a picture of judgment. But then see the salvation that God is promising through it. Keep going in the passage. From there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart, with all your soul, when you're in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. So we'll talk more about this when we get to the takeaways from this chapter. But just remember this picture of salvation actually coming through judgment in a way that being swallowed by a fish depicts, as well as this language of being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So this phrase is interesting because, well, yes, it's obviously a reference to three days, but this phrase was also a popular way to express the journey toward death. It was almost cliche in ancient times to say that going to death was a journey of a few days, three days, kind of similar to how we, at least where I live in the U.S., might refer to someone being six feet under. I could say, man, I thought that person was six feet under. And that could mean literally six feet underground, or it could mean I thought he was dead and buried. In a similar way, this phrase, three days and three nights, would mean it's like he went to death and came back to life. And then you think about it. Three days illustrates that picture in other places in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham and Isaac go on a journey for three days to Mount Moriah, where Isaac almost dies, but comes back alive. In Exodus chapter 15, God's people journey into the wilderness and they don't have water for three days. They're about to die until God miraculously provides water for them and they live. In 2 Kings chapter 20, Hezekiah is about to die, but he prays. God tells him he'll live. And on the third day, he goes up to the temple. And in Jonah's contemporary Hosea chapter 6 verse 1, we read, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. So this picture in Jonah that we have is helping us connect God's rescue of Jonah from death with how God brings his people from death to life. And in it, we're realizing, obviously, God did not want Jonah dead. Instead, God wanted to bring Jonah to a place where he would be alone with him and experience salvation through judgment. And it's fascinating how the author sets this up. You'll notice a period here in the middle of verse 17. That's intentional because in the original language, there's actually what's called a pausal accent right here in the middle of the verse that's intended to lead us as the hearers of this story to pause. The action is now dramatically slowed down. We've had Jonah running, we've had storm, we've had all these conversations. Now it's slowing down and it's time for us to watch this encounter between Jonah and the Lord, where chapter 2, verse 1 says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. This is the first time we see this Hebrew word for pray in the story. Until now, it was just the sailor saying, call on your God. And if you remember, Jonah didn't do it. In fact, all throughout the first chapter of the book, not one time did Jonah say anything to God. But now, for the first time, Jonah communicates with God, setting up a pretty powerful moment in the book as he prays, verse 2, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. So apparently being thrown into the water had an effect on Jonah. He called out same word that was used by the sailors in verses 6 and 14 of chapter 1. So he finally did it. He called out to God. 
Why now? Because he was in distress. The word means in dire straits. And the Lord answered him. Doubtless Jonah would have been familiar with these words from different Psalms. Israel's songbook, Psalm chapter 18, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Psalm chapter 120, verse 1, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And then, in what is pretty common in Hebrew po poetry, Jonah basically repeats the same idea, but he elaborates on it with different words. So he says, I called out to the Lord, to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. And then when you get to verse the end of, of verse 2, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. And this language is significant on a couple of levels. One, Sheol here is a reference to the abode of the dead, a place of utter, complete hopelessness from which there is no return. Job chapter 7, verse 9 says, As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. And it's a place of total separation from God and his goodness. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 18 says, For Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope for your faithfulness. Basically, Jonah saw himself headed not just to death, but to eternal hopelessness. And in that moment, with no breath in the Mediterranean Sea, it hit him. I don't want to go there. And Jonah knew God was his only hope for not going to Sheol. Another thing that's significant about the language here is the way Jonah refers to the belly of Sheol. It's the only time we see this phrase in the entire Bible. And just reading the English, you might think this is the same word, belly, that we see at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 with Jonah in the belly of the fish. But it's actually a different word here that also means womb. And here's why that's significant to know. So let's just kind of write that, that this word can mean womb. So now go back with me with that information to chapter, to chapter 1, verse 17. You might turn back there in your notes real quick or just look at it there. The first time we see the fish mentioned, the word there for fish, the Lord appointed a great fish. The first time we see fish there, that word is a masculine noun. So used to refer to a male fish. But then in verse 1 of chapter 2, the author changes this and we see fish. This is actually, so we'll put an M over here for masculine. We'll put an F here for feminine, which begs the question, why the change? Well, a feminine noun would carry more maternal connotations. And paired with the womb of Sheol, later here in verse 2, the author is subtly but beautifully pointing out how Jonah was in the throes of death and hopelessness. But when he called to the Lord, much like a baby being born from a mother's womb, the Lord was making a way for Jonah to be brought to life again, to be, in a sense, reborn from death and utter hopelessness. Out of the womb, the belly of Sheol, I called to you, and you heard my voice. Which leads to verse 3, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded, you, surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Just look at this wording. Jonah attributes everything that has happened to him to God. Actually, notice that Jonah goes from talking about God in verse 2 to talking to God here in verse 3. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. You did this. In other words, the sailors didn't throw me off the boat. The wind and waves didn't just happen. You did this. The flood surrounded me, not of its own will. It was your waves and your billows that passed over me. This is identical language to Psalm 42, verse 7. Deep calls the deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and all your waves have gone over me. Then in Jonah chapter 2, verse 4, Jonah says, Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple cast in the deep heart of the sea, surrounded by flood and the waves and the billows of God, Jonah concludes, I am driven away from God's sight. And the word for driven away there is the same word we see in Genesis 3.24.
when after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, remember what the Bible says? God drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Jonah saw himself as banished from God's presence on the way to death until he looked again to God's holy temple, the place where God dwells. A powerful image and a turning point when you think about this whole story starting with Jonah fleeing from where? from the presence of the Lord. Now he's turning toward the presence of the Lord as he's drowning, which he elaborates on more in verse 5. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. Jonah's basically describing the journey he was experiencing toward death by drowning. The waters closed in over me to take my life. As he sunk, the deep surrounded me. What imagery. Just imagine the darkness of the water circling around him as he sinks to the bottom of the sea where seaweed wraps about his head like grave clothes for burial. Verse 6, he's at the roots of the mountains. Picture the high mountains whose bases extend all the way down to the bottom of the sea to the ocean floor where I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. The word for land here was the, has the kind of sense of the underworld, a place from which he could never escape, where bars would close upon him forever, like without end. Yet you. I love this. I put an exclamation point, or a lot of them there. Like, yet you. One of the many places in the Bible where everything seems lost and hopeless, even forever. Yet God. But God, you brought up my life from the pit. Oh Lord, my God. You brought up the same word that Amos, Jonah's contemporary, uses as God says, also, it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Just as God brought up his people from slavery in Egypt, Jonah says, you brought up my life from the pit. And even this picture of bringing up is a major contrast from what we saw in chapter one and at the beginning of chapter two, right? Where Jonah is continually descending down, down Israel, down to Joppa, down to the bottom of the ship, down to the sea, down to the deep, down to the base of the mountains. Everything Jonah has done has been downward to the lowest depths possible, to the bars of death and Sheol. But the Lord, his God, meets him there and he brings him up from the pit, a word that also means grave. And then it continues, when my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Again, just picture Jonah drowning. He's to the point where he has no breath left in him when the Lord. And the Lord actually comes first in the Hebrew here. The Lord, I remembered. I remembered Yahweh. And my prayer came to you. And the phrase, into your holy temple, is such a powerful image. Jonah's in the midst of the depths of the earth, as far as he could possibly be from Mount Zion, the temple. But God hears Jonah's prayer. He says in verse 8, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. The most plain reading of this verse is that Jonah is very glad he's not put his hope in vain idols at this point. The word for vain is so good. It's a combination of breath and emptiness. Jonah is saying from the depths of an ocean floor, completely out of breath, that idols are empty and offer no hope for breath to him there. They're vain. They are idols. And the word for idols there literally means a snare. Idols are deceptive snares. They promise you so much. But when you most need them, when you're at your lowest point, they prove completely empty. Our only hopes in the depth of despair, Jonah says, is the steadfast love of the Lord. And this right here is one of the greatest words in the Old Testament. So you might write it down. It is the way it would sound in English is hesed. Hesed. 
And there's really no one word in English that sums up this Hebrew word. It's like love and kindness and loyalty and faithfulness and mercy all wrapped into one. It is a beautiful word. This, Jonah says, is my only source of hope. The hased, the love, kindness, loyalty, faithfulness, and mercy of the one true God. And in the next verse, Jonah contrasts himself with idolaters, saying, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Jonah says, in contrast to idolaters, I will sacrifice to you, Lord. I will pay vows to you. And then we come to the five English words that many would say are the theme of the entire book. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Like, mark that. The Lord saves. Salvation belongs to him. Meaning the Lord is sovereign over salvation. He alone is able and he alone has authority to save. And he saves completely. Verse 10 and the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This fish had apparently traveled all the way back toward Joppa. And could we just pause and point out here, amidst all we're talking about with Jonah, this was an uncomfortable three days for the fish. But not a lot of people read this book and express sympathy for the fish, but I think we should. Nobody likes a stomach ache, especially one that's caused by a living organism inside you. So let's at least pause for a moment and feel a bit for the fish, who the Lord, the sovereign God over the fish speaks to, and it vomits. And the word the author uses there is intentionally pretty disgusting. So I'll tell you what's in my mind here. And this will be a bit of an aside, but I promise not too graphic. We, uh, not long ago, I'll leave the timeline a bit general, but fairly recently, um, somebody had, had brought our family some food, um, and we were eating it, uh, for dinner and, uh, it involved some chicken and, uh, we ate it, tasted great. And, uh, we were going to bed and one of my children, I won't mention which one, uh, comes to me. He's like, I'm not feeling very good, dad. My stomach's not feeling good, very good. I said, oh, okay, well, let me set you up. Here's a, a, a bucket. Uh, we'll put it by your bed on a towel. If anything goes wrong, just, you know, use the bucket. And uh, I promise I'm not, I could get this too graphic. Well, he, he later comes up and uh, to uh, my room and he's like, uh, dad, uh, I, I threw up. And I was like, okay, did you hit the bucket? And he's like, no, I went running past the bucket. And so it's like everywhere and all over the bathroom. I was like, buddy, that was, that was what the bucket was for. And so, uh, so I'm like, oh, it's all right, it's all right. I mean, he wasn't obviously feeling good. So I get him situated back. I'm like, all right, here's the bucket. Like use the bucket. And then I go and I start cleaning up. Uh, Heather, uh, my wife usually does all the, all the hard stuff around the house. I'll just put that. But this particular, like throw up, she just doesn't do. And so this is like my assignment. And so I'm cleaning up the, the bathroom and it's, it's a mess. And, uh, I finished doing all that. And then I, I go back toward my room. Well, on the way back toward my room, I see one of our other kids rooms and this child who will remain unnamed also has, has also experienced, uh, the same thing that the other sibling had experienced. And he's done the same thing in his room. He didn't have a bucket. And I go into the bathroom right near him. And it was like a war zone. Like it was, it was, I've never seen anything like it. And so I'm like, okay, buddy. So I'm like cleaning him up like Clorox wipes, like all over his body. And then in his room, then I get him set up with a bucket and then I start cleaning the bathroom. Then it's when it hit me because I'm not feeling good right now. And I'm like, oh no, this is, this is making its way through the whole, the whole house. And we got, we got five kids in the house. Uh, thankfully the baby, uh, had another meal that night. So, but I know it's coming. So I, I get buckets. And by this time, I'm not feeling good. I'm literally crawling on my hands and knees into different rooms and waking kids, my wife, Heather up. I'm just like, it's coming. <laughs> like, you're going to need this. So just use this when it, when it comes. And sure enough, like one, like we all went down. So all that to say, that's, that's the picture I have in my mind when I picture 
love it here in uh, Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. And nobody likes this. Like, nobody thinks, oh, that's a great story. I would love to have been a part of that. Like, no. Let's make sure we get the picture here. And Jonah too, because it's not pretty. Again, you put yourself in Jonah's shoes. This is a humbling scene. Like, not, not you vomited, you were vomited. Like, you just got spit up on shore and you're laying there with fish vomit all over you. And that's how Jonah chapter 2 ends. Now, here's the deal. Before we come to a couple of incredible takeaways from this chapter, I want to ask a few questions looking back at this chapter. And I put it that way intentionally because I genuinely want to ask questions, not draw conclusions at this point. When you read commentaries on Jonah, you find a variety of different views on Jonah's prayer in this chapter. And not everybody agrees here. But just ask the question, do you notice anything off in Jonah's prayer? Anything that doesn't seem quite right? Anything that seems to indicate Jonah's heart is not yet where it needs to be? Anything that's missing? And you look back over all these verses, you'll notice, well, first, at no point does Jonah confess his sin or express a desire to repent. Not once, which is a pretty significant contrast to every other psalm where sin is recognized as the cause of distress. The person praying will confess and repent. Look at Psalm chapter 32, verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Or Psalm chapter 51, verse 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, has said, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight, so you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And there's none of this language in Jonah 2. Jonah at no point acknowledges his sin or guilt or even asks for forgiveness. Could it be that Jonah may not be taking responsibility for what's happened to him? Particularly when you see that this, his language is all about what God has done to him, how God has cast him into the deep and hurled him into the sea and surrounded him with a flood and passed over him with waves and billows. And then to take this question to another level, did you notice that the only things Jonah does mention about himself are positive? How he called out to the Lord and he looked toward God's temple and he remembered the Lord and he made sacrifices and vows. There's a sense in which even this prayer seems a lot about him. I just, let's just go back through these verses. And circle the number of times either I or me or my is mentioned. Now, how often does Jonah talk about himself in this prayer? He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. He answered me out of the bell of Sheol. I cried, you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your ways and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That's 23 times in eight short verses that Jonah talks about himself. And he actually talks relatively little about God and his mercy. At the beginning, he says, God heard him and answered him. Then in the middle, he says, God brought his life up from the pit. So that's three phrases and this entire prayer focused on what God did for him. And then did you notice in all three of those phrases, Jonah actually focuses on the good things he did to bring that about. I called and you answered. I cried and God heard my voice. God brought up my life from the pit because I remembered the Lord. And even that phrase in verse seven, so the Lord I remembered is different from what we see, what we see everywhere else in scripture. Almost every other time in the Bible, that we see this picture of remembrance like this with one exception. The focus is always on the Lord and his mercy, remembering his people, not his people and their piety, remembering the Lord. 
One commentary I read compared this story in Jonah 1 and 2 to Noah's story in Genesis 6 through 9 and pointed out that the central phrase in Noah's story, Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts on the livestock that were with him on the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. That's the whole point of the Noah story. God remembered Noah. And it should be the whole point of the Jonah story, that God remembered Jonah. So is Jonah missing the point? Then when you get to the end of verses se- verse 7 and end of verses 8 and 9, as Jonah talks about his prayer, and then contrasts himself with idol worshipers, it makes you wonder, Who's, who's Jonah talking about here? And in context, it's quite possible that Jonah is referring here to the pagan sailors on the ship who were calling out on, to all their gods. And you start to wonder, wait a minute. Is Jonah saying, I'm glad I'm not like those guys? Kind of like the Pharisee's prayer in Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 18, verse 11, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Is Jonah saying, I'm glad I'm not like those sailors? Then he talks about how he's going to give sacrifices and pay vows to God. But remember, Jonah doesn't know What happened after he was thrown overboard? He doesn't know that these sailors actually feared the Lord with great fear and they offered sacrifices and made vows. Yet again, even with Jonah's words here at the end of chapter 2, we're wondering who really fears the Lord, Jonah or those sailors? And whose sacrifice and vows were authentic, Jonah or those sailors? particularly when you remember what God has said in his word about sacrifices. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen on the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Whoa. Do you see? Do you hear that? Here's Jonah in his prayer talking about sacrifices and vows when he has said nothing about how he disobeyed the voice of the Lord. Here's Jonah contrasting himself with idolaters when he is guilty of rebellion, which is iniquity and what? Idolatry. Is it possible that Jonah is presuming upon God's grace and God's mercy and God's willingness to rescue him completely apart from repentance of sin and obedience to God. Kind of like the people of Israel were doing in the days of Jeroboam. Remember the context of the whole book? Remember God's word through Jonah to King Jeroboam? It was a word of blessing even though the people were sinning against God and they weren't repenting. They were presuming upon God's mercy apart from repentance. God will be merciful to us. They thought we're his chosen people and we don't need to repent of our sin. Again, just asking these questions at this point and there's more story to come. And it's possible that Jonah's prayer here was completely authentic, albeit imperfect. And even that, praise God. We don't have to be perfect in our prayers. And we often come to God with So much more need for his grace than we even realize. I think we'd have to include, though, at the very least, that there's still more work to be done in Jonah's heart, which actually leads us to the takeaways from this chapter, and they are glorious, and they're all about God. So, one, God is merciful toward the most undeserving sinners. We saw this in chapter one with God's pursuit of sinful pagans, Now we see it all the more in chapter 2 with God's pursuit of a selfish prophet. Here is Jonah running from God, then praying to God in ways that may even seem self-centered and self-righteous, yet God is still pursuing him. God doesn't let him die. God does hear his cry. And even if Jonah thinks it's all about him, we know this story is all about God and his mercy toward him. Jonah doesn't deserve it, but God is giving it. 
And I just want to bring this into our lives right now and point out what I hope is obvious to you and me. We need the same mercy. We are undeserving sinners, all of us. We have all rebelled against God, and we are all prone to cover up our rebellion in all kinds of ways, including self-centeredness. How easy is it for any of us to rebel against God and then to focus on all the consequences of our sin as if we had nothing to do with it? Or we're even prone to self-righteousness, to think that we're not like this person or those people, that we're better in this way or that way, when the reality is we are all undeserving sinners. You are, I am, we all are. And the good news of Jonah is that God is merciful toward the most undeserving. Please hear this. I know there are some of you part of the secret church right now who are running from God. You're rebelling against God in all kinds of ways, maybe in ways that are public that others know about, maybe in ways that are private and secret and only you and God know. But that's the point. God knows God sees, God remembers, and God loves you. Hear the good news of the Bible. God's capacity to forgive is greater than your capacity to sin. God is pursuing you right now. God has brought you to this secret church, to this moment, to hear this good news. He loves you. And He, God, wants to save you from the pit of sin and all of its consequences, ultimately death. You are not too far gone for God. And that's the second takeaway. God is able to bring life to the dead. We saw this imagery over and over again in Jonah 2, out of the belly of Sheol, cast into the deep, down into the pit, in the land whose bars will close upon you forever. God is able to bring you from the lowest depths to the highest depths heights from death to life. And this is where we just can't leave Jonah chapter 2 in the Old Testament because Jesus references this story in the New Testament when some self-righteous religious teachers are questioning him. And they say, so this is Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, and some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Oh, do you remember? We talked about this phrase, three days and three nights. This journey to death, the finality of death, six feet under. So Jesus, when he's talking about going to the cross, he says, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish so i will be the son of man three days and three nights in the heart of the earth in other words you're going to think i'm six feet under gone and dead when the reality is i am coming back to life this is the gospel and just think about the comparisons or really contrasts here between jonah and jesus Jonah experienced judgment for his sin. All that Jonah experienced here was a result of his disobedience to God. And we talked about how Jonah was experiencing salvation through judgment for his sin. But with Jesus, the picture is totally different. Yes, it's salvation through judgment, but not for his sin. Jesus experienced judgment for our sin. Jesus died on a cross and went to a grave to pay the price of sin that you and I are due. Jesus was forsaken by the Father as he paid the price for our rebellion against God. On the cross, Jesus took the judgment and the holy wrath of the Father that we deserve so that we wouldn't have to for the sake of our salvation, salvation through judgment. And then after those three days, think about the contrast. Jonah was alive after three days in a fish, but Jesus was alive after three days in a grave. This picture in Jonah is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. God is able to take what ought to be a place of death and turn it into a place of deliverance and life. And the good news of the Bible is that God is able to do this in your life. I I mentioned, remember we put a big box around it, exclamation points, verse 6 of Jonah 2, that this is one of the many, many places in the Bible where we see this phrase, yet God or but God. 
I just want you to think about them, hear them, believe them, see them in Scripture. So we saw that, yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. So let's think about other places in the Bible, like Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Psalm chapter 49, verse 14 and 15. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. He will receive me. Psalm chapter 33, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Matthew chapter 19. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God. All things are possible. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone might even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's a pretty bleak picture until you get to verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together, death to life with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. He raised us up with him, seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast. All of that because of Acts chapter 13, verse 29 and 30. When they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree, talking about the cross, and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Huh. I, I wrote a forward for a book uh, recently called But God, The Power of Hope When Catastrophe Crashes. It's the story of Caleb Freeman. He's a teenager. He's in a devastating car accident with a 10% chance of survival. And his dad, Jeremy Freeman, tells the story of God's mercy and provision and redemption through Caleb's life. It all revolves around this phrase, But God. God is able to bring life to the dead, which means no matter how low things get for you, no matter how hard, heavy, hopeless things feel, with God there is always, always, always hope because God is able to bring life to the dead. Which leads to the last takeaway from Jonah chapter 2. God is merciful toward the most undeserving Sinners, God is able to bring life to the dead. And God is sovereign over all salvation. We saw it in Jonah 1, that God's sovereignty is absolute, right? God has ultimate authority over all things, including nature. We saw that in the wind and the waves. In chapter 1, we see it again in chapter 2, as God speaks to and directs a fish. But the emphasis in this takeaway is on God's sovereignty over salvation. The phrase this chapter closes with, salvation belongs to the Lord, which means, so follow this, that means God alone is the author of salvation. In the words of Peter in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That word for salvation there, and then you see it in Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, salvation belongs to to the Lord, that word is from the root word Yeshua, which means the Lord saves, which is the name for Jesus in the New Testament. It's what his name means. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel tells Joseph that Mary will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I want to pause right here and say, because I'm, I'm not assuming that everyone that's a part of Secret Church is necessarily, truly a follower of Jesus. And I would just ask every person right now, have you in your life trusted in Jesus 
as the Savior of your life. He alone is able to save you from your sins based on his death on the cross for you and your sins and his resurrection from the grave. And I urge you to put your trust in him as Savior. And even now, like this, this be the moment in your heart. Let this secret church be the time where you say, yes, I want you to be the author of my salvation, knowing that second, God alone is the giver of salvation. And he loves giving it. He wants to give it to you. And the picture we're seeing here in Jonah is that he's free to give it to whoever he desires. This is Exodus 33, verse 19, when God speaks to Moses and said, I will make all my goodness pass in front, pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. Then Paul quotes from this verse in Romans 9, and he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. We read, read the same thing a minute ago in Ephesians chapter 2. Salvation is a free gift from God, not based on man's works. Salvation is all of grace. That grace comes from God alone. Ephesians 2, we were dead in our sin. Dead people don't choose to come to life. Dead people have to be brought to life, and only God can do that. We don't save ourselves. Like From start to finish, God saves us. When someone asks you how you become a Christian, don't how did you become a Christian? Don't start with, well, I, I did this. I I Well, fill in the blank. No, start with, God did this. God changed my life. And one of my favorite quotes from Charles Spurgeon, he said, one weekend when I was sitting in the house of God, he said, I was not thinking about the preacher's sermon, or I did not believe it. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, maybe the preacher's, yeah, apparently wasn't doing a good job that day. He said, but the thought struck me as he's thinking to himself, how did you come to be a Christian? And he thought, I sought the Lord. Then he thought, but how did you come to seek the Lord? The truth flashed across my mind in a moment. I should not have sought him unless there had been some previous influence in my mind to make me seek him. I prayed, thought I, he said, but then I asked myself, well, how did I come to pray? I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. Well, how did I come to read the scriptures? I did read them, but what led me to do so? And then Spurgeon said in a moment, I saw that God was at the bottom of it all, that he was the author of my faith. So the whole doctrine of grace opened up to me, and from that doctrine I have not departed to this day, and I desire to make this my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God. I think of a new believer I met in Buddhist Thailand. He had just been baptized. He said, I am so happy. I didn't even know to search for God, but God came searching for me. <laughs> this is my story. I think of all the people whom God put in my life to point me to Jesus, all the circumstances God used to open my eyes to his love for me. This is the story of every follower of Jesus. It's the story of some people right now who are realizing God's doing this in your life right now, that God has brought you to the place where you are at this moment because he loves you and he's pursuing you and he's writing a story in your life that maybe you have given up on him, but he has not given up on you. He loves you and he wants to save you from your sin and draw you into a relationship with him and experience eternal life with him. And this will be our song for all of eternity. This is not just Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. This is Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, which we've already read once. Let's bring it back and notice the language. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Do you see it? God is the giver of salvation. It belongs to him. And he has chosen to give it to people from every nation, from all tribes, all peoples, and all languages. That's his prerogative. God has ordained for all the nations to enjoy the salvation he gives in such a way that for all of eternity, people from every nation will be seeing salvation belongs to our God. All right, so this is a good stopping point and a good time to encourage each other to give for the spread of this salvation to the nations and to celebrate how this salvation is spreading. So let me pause here. I'm going to turn it over to Stephen to talk about the opportunity we have to give 
and then to learn what God is doing in the church in Iran right now. And then I want to come back and lead us in prayer. Are you sure you want to go to Iran? I got this question a lot in the weeks leading up to our trip. Like anyone who has traveled to places known for Christian persecution, I got some looks when I told others where I was going. But that's not really surprising. What was surprising, though, were the first words I heard when I arrived in Iran from the customs officer. He asked, almost in disbelief, Why are you here? If you're a Christian, the answer to that question will shape your life. It might change the way you look at money, the things you spend time and energy on. It might change the way you look at the person you could potentially marry. It might take you to places you never imagined you'd go to. It might even take you to a mosque. Not all mosques are the same, but they're all fascinating architectural wonders. And they're the center of religious life for Muslims. For devout Muslims, daily life revolves around prayer. They pray five times a day. And mosques are built as centers of worship and prayer. Before they pray, they perform a ritual cleansing at a fountain in the courtyard. Then men and women separate into two different rooms and pray in rows behind the imam, or the leader of the congregational prayers who stands on the minbar, which is like a pulpit. This all involves standing, bowing, and sitting on prayer mats, all an act of submission to Allah. So when Muslims pray, they're supposed to be pointing towards Mecca, the city where it's believed Muhammad received visions from Allah. And we see this in the architecture of mosques because they have a mihrab or a niche in the wall that indicates the direction of Mecca. There's even a tower called a minaret where the call to prayer is announced. Plus, you've probably also noticed most mosques have a dome, and that's because it represents the vault of heaven. So much of the physical building has representative elements of their faith, so you won't see the same type of iconography or art that you'd see in a Catholic church or a Gothic cathedral. You know, I've been to a lot of mosques outside of Iran. Many of them are huge, beautiful buildings that attract thousands of visitors. As soon as I got to Iran, I visited mosque after mosque of different shapes and sizes. But there were no tourists here, no one taking selfies, just hundreds and even thousands of Muslims praying to Allah. There are places on this earth where the atmosphere of spiritual warfare is palpable. You can feel the enemy. And we realize the danger of visiting this place. Just getting these shots required us to use small hidden cameras. And yet this is just a small taste of what Christians in Iran face every day. There are no church buildings. There's no freedom to worship Jesus openly. To follow Jesus means to live an enemy territory. So if you ask me why I went to Iran, I went to understand the struggles of my brothers and sisters and what life under persecution looks and feels like. Ultimately, I came to find the answer to the question, what does the church look like in a nation of mosques? In spite of travel advisories, tourism in Iran is a growing economy, and it's consistently gone up over the years. In 2019, right before the pandemic, Iran was visited by 9.1 million tourists, about 2 million more than the year before. That makes Iran the fourth most visited nation in the Middle East, only behind Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt. And there's a lot to see. For any Bible nerds out there, you can visit Esther and Mordecai's tombs. Or you can go to the Galestan Palace or Persepolis and see traces of ancient history, stories of leaders and empires from thousands of years ago. Or you could visit Tehran's Grand Bazaar, a marketplace filled with everything that's been there for hundreds of years. Or you could race down a roller coaster on Mount Toha.
There is so much to see in Iran. But no matter where you go, one thing you can't escape is that it's the Islamic Republic of Iran. Islam is everywhere. There are pictures of the Ayatollah everywhere. Our hotel didn't have Gideon Bibles in the drawers. They had Qurans and prayer mats and an arrow on the ceiling pointing you to Mecca. As we were exploring Tehran, our guide would stop several times throughout the day at different mosques to do his prayers. It all got me wondering, in a country that is so dominated by Islam, how would anyone even hear about Jesus? Tell me a little bit about your story. How did you come to know Jesus? And just what was that journey like? I was born in a Muslim Shia family. This is Iman. He spent almost a decade as a refugee in Turkey after needing to flee Iran because of his faith. Unfortunately, Muslim, they believe that they are Jew and Christian, they are not clean, and they call them Najif. It means that you cannot touch them, because if you touch the, these people, you will be unclean. But my father, the way they teaching us, they said, no, you shouldn't think in that way. I remember we, it, has a, it was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the fasting, the, all the Jew fasting from one day, 24 hours on. That night, uh, I remember my very good friend. Uh, he told me, uh, Iman, if the, we are believed to every single, we're doing all of the single uh, law in the Sharia, in the, in the, the Ten Commandments, but we are not uh, believed to the Messiah or the Messiah to come, we are not even Jew. And then, it's, it's, it was in my mind, it's about one year after, there was a church and they were talking about Jesus. And they said, Jesus is the Christ and he's the Messiah. When I heard that, I was just, just my, I was, all of my attention came and I listened to them. And they had the one uh, number, they said, if you want New Testament, send us an email. And then I sent an email to them, can I have a New Testament? Iman received a copy of the New Testament and he couldn't put it down. Because of both his Muslim background and his Jewish friends, he was already a little familiar with Old Testament stories. But this New Testament gave him the true interpretation of who Christ was. And after that, I, I went to, uh, to my friend, in the, he's a Jewish, and I said, uh, I heard this Jesus, if the uh, son, of, uh, son of the God, and he's a uh, Messiah, you're looking for it. And my friend said, no, Jesus was a lawyer. And he said many, many bad things about Jesus. Yeah. I was shocked because I really trust them, you know? You're Jewish. Uh, the Jewish friend, yes. One night I was feeling so, so bad. And I keep reading my New Testament. I know I'm a sinner. I know I have no way to be getting salvation. I know that, you know? But when I'm reading the uh, New Testament, my heart is going to be full of the joy of the God. It's the first time I created that God, if you are really, you are the son of the God, please save me, please help me. The minute I pray that I finish, I feel like everything, like atmosphere for my room is changed. And I feel like the presence of the God. I heard the voice, I said, Iman, follow me, I want to change your life. And I was just looking back at the my back, I see the light and I see the Jesus. And he showed his hand to me, said, Iman, I die for you. Follow me, I want to change your life. That I was start to cry. Government numbers will identify 99% of the population as Muslim. Not really surprising when everyone is automatically assigned Islam as a religion at birth. But the reality is that that number is much lower. Some reports even have it under 50%. I touched on this in a previous video, but an Islamic government that imposes Islam on its people does not equal a truly Islamic people. And when that government continues to let down and even oppress its own people, you can understand how many Iranians would be dissatisfied and disillusioned with Islam as a whole. But what's most encouraging is not necessarily Islam's decline, but rather how much Christianity has grown because even though many Iranians were let down by Islam, it didn't mean they stopped looking for answers. In my country, Iran, when I grew up, 
uh, all the things you can do is belong or used to belong to the mosque. So if you want to play ping pong or football, or, I mean soccer, football. <laughs> yeah, we, we're uh, not real football. Yes, the real football, exactly. So you should go to mosque. So I was in the mosque almost every day and people were praying, doing the Islamic namaz and everything and the mullahs were there. So I always had questions. This is Milad. He left Iran years ago after facing relentless persecution. He told me about how he would often go to the mullah or religious leader of his community to try to understand the Quran. I always had questions. So once I, I, told, I asked one of them, what does this verse means in Quran? And uh, that man told me, we don't know. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, this is a secret between the prophet and God. So I was like, I'm hearing you telling all these people that this book is given to guide us. So why do we need to have some secret between the prophet and God in the book, which is role is to you know, guide us in life and we don't know the meanings. Imagine seeking the truth only to be told God was keeping secrets. What a disappointment. But in God's good grace, there is something in Persian culture that just drives them to keep pressing on, looking for answers. And in that search, many are finding Jesus. برای من یک سری سوالات پیش اومد که تا حالا هیچ وقت بهش بر نخورده بودم چون ما همیشه قرآن رو عربی میخوندیم و این بودش که توی قرآن نوشته بودش که تنها کسی که روح القدس رو داشت ایسای مسیح بود تنها کسی که قرار بیا دنیا رو داوری کنه ایسای مسیح بود و همینجور که میخوندم سوالاتی برای من پیش میومد که هیچ جوابی براش نبود و وقتی که از پدرم میپرسیدم گفت این سوالات رو ما نمیدونیم یه سری از علما میدونن و من انقدر ترسیده بودم که اگه میگفتن اگه همجور قرآن رو بخونم من هم خودم دیگه مس... یعنی مسلمون بودن خودم از دست میدم و اونو گذاشتم کنم For security reasons I can't say much about her but her story is one of many of Persians searching for answers یک روزی به این نتیجه یعنی کم کم خدا به من نشون داد که اسلام یک چیز دروغینه چون یه چیزی برای من پیش اومد که محمد یه پیامبری که اومده مرده ولی اسلام میگه که عیسی زنده است و قرار بیا و من برای من سوال این بود اگر عیسی زنده است و قرار بیا دنیا جا داوری کنه چرا خدا بعدش یه پیامبری میاد میفرسته که نمیره و نمیتونه هیچ کاری برای من با انجامش بده وقتی انجیلی که باز کردم بخونم یک لحظه به معنی نام عیسی که معنی نجات دهنده است پی بردم یعنی هفته بعدش که رفتم که حساب قلبم به عیسی مسیح دادم Remember Nima he came out in the first episode of this series he knows a thing or two about reaching Iran In the west you can just get on a radio or TV or yeah. just do you know public ministry in Iran it's different you have to work out your strategies like um, we going for shopping Again, we don't need to shop, but we're going, pretending to be shoppers and talking to the salespersons because again, those are the ones who are actually meeting so many people on a daily basis. But again, there are lots of challenges. The one year, uh, God connected me with uh, one, uh, some of the other people, like uh, four or five people, they came to faith and we had just one new testament. We had, So when you got, you would share with your other five friends. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we pre- we're doing the printing them and they giving to them to like uh, read it. And we going somewhere like a mountain and we start to pray for that city. And then we walk into a street and we are just pray for that city, you know. And if we had some opportunity to share the gospel to them. At one instance, I remember we were talking to the guy. And then he said, okay, let me call my friend to come and hear. We realize he's actually calling the police. So I still is dangerous. But I hear some people are doing boss evangelism. It's a bit risky, but when they're getting off, they just get up and say, Jesus is the savior, and then leave some Bibles and, and just take off. And God, uh, after three years, we one time we came together We just thinking, we were just working, working, and then we, came, we just recognized that we are almost 300 people. Oh, yes. 
just from one-on-one -on -one sharing the gospel through conversation. I was walking through the courtyard of the Ibn Bafia Cemetery, the same one where Takti is buried, and I came across a funeral service taking place. This is a historic site where technically you're not allowed to bury people anymore, but many still do. Funerals can mark some of the most somber and dark moments of our lives, and as most Christians have experienced, it's one of those occasions where we're especially thankful to have a church family. We're supposed to come alongside those experiencing loss, right? Weep with those who weep. And it's a time when your pastor or other members of your church join you to, to pray or share a word from scripture, counsel family members. But all of it got me thinking, what happens when a Christian in Iran dies? Or if someone in, in your house church passes away? Or what about other significant moments in the lives of Christians, baptisms, weddings, and even just regular church, where do you go? About 25 years ago, we had buildings, but I think about about five, six years ago, they, they shut down all the churches. So we had house group churches, everything is on the ground. Everything is house churches now. So Iranian churches now in Iran, they all house sales like China. So they meet in groups, the houses, they move around meetings. They have to be really careful uh, even though over the, over the phone, they cannot be direct. They cannot call each other brothers and sisters. Uh, they have to be really, really careful in terms of gatherings, evangelism, singing songs, preaching. Everywhere in the society they go, they have to be mindful, especially when they are in close gatherings like family gatherings or any parties they go. They have to be careful when they talk about their personal beliefs because you never know, maybe your brother, your parents, your family members will turn you in. خب من هم کلیسای ساختمانی رفتم هم کلیسای هم کلیسای یعنی خانگی رفتم. کلیسای خانگی خب اینکه مشارکت از نزدیک خیلی خوب بود ولی خب ما نمیتونستیم هیچ وقت بلند پرستش کنیم. و اینکه خب یه ذره اگه نکات مثبتش رو بگم اینکه خب امین مشارکتی که با هم داشتیم رابطه صمیمی که بینمون پیش یعنی رابطه صمیمی که بین ما بود و اینکه خب کلیسای خانگی روی تعلیم دادن روی اینکه تغذیه روحانی شد شدن خیلی برای ما مفید بود تغذیه روحانی بیشتری شدیم تونستیم بیشتر خدمت کنیم یعنی خدماتی که توی کلیسای خانگی من داشتم What make me sad nowadays is when people talk about church they make it so complicated and professional sound. But where I grew up, it was a bunch of us, mostly young people, uh, who became Christian and the family deny them or they don't want to be around them, they come and join us. Yeah. We didn't like a family. We had food, we talk, we sing. I play the little guitar and we sing worship song, we eat food. We read the Bible and we try to understand. We ask the churches in Tehran and the, you know, the more mature Christian brothers we know to help us to understand the scripture and we grow up. Mm. So it was very raw and it was very close relationship based kind of gathering. Although we did not have many things, we did not have so many people or big buildings, but what is the purpose of being church? Growing and help other people to know Christ. Mm. And I think we succeed on that. Yeah. Was that, so was that something where you guys were meeting in secret? Yes. Was it difficult to uh, communicate with other Christians? I mean, what did, the, what did it look like? Like, how do you share the gospel? How do you do that when it's all, you know, well, secretive? Secret, yes, all in secret. We were all 007's agents. We yeah. know how to, you know, <laughs> took off the SIM cards from the phone, put it into the, you know, yeah. somewhere safe, and uh, always someone by the window is checking the outside, mm -hmm. uh, not singing with a loud voice, everything. But we know we are risking our life. Yeah. But it was like, that's the life that God is giving mm -hmm. us, and it's worth to risk it to reach mm -hmm. others. That's the point. Yeah, that's the point. One time when I was sharing the gospel, the government arrested me. I've been one night, uh, they beat me, and one night I've been in the jail, and then bring me out. It's the first time they arrest me. And because you were 
evangelize it. Evangelize it. And it was a Christmas. We make a small bag with a, uh, it's a small book name is the, just the way of the salvation. We printed with some chocolate, they put it in the bag and we passed it out to people and said, Merry Christmas. And they, I arrived home at 3 a.m. And I see that someone lock, uh, knocked the door and it was a two uh, big guy came and opened the door. And one of them had a camera and other one uh, came and they put us and my family to the, uh, sit in the chair and then they came and they took everything, like my books and computer, everything, and they brought me to the jail. I've been 29 days in the one room. I didn't know it's a morning, in the night, or what is that? They put you in a room where you didn't know what time it was. They bring me to the court and they said, you are uh, blamed as a, a, a spa for the Israel. A spy for it. Israel, and then making some uh, groups against the government. And because in Iran we don't have the Christian yeah. uh, like a punishment, we say uh, they put you in the category of political mostly. This is one aspect of the story that's worth exploring more, and we'll do so in the next video. The realities of modern society and belonging to organizations like the UN should technically move Iran to treat its citizens with a certain level of dignity and care that they're currently violating, particularly to minorities like Christians. I was studying software engineering in, in university, and I was on my last semester when they arrest my father and everyone else. And then the, the school authority called me in the office and said, this is your last semester, finish it or not, we're not going to give you a certificate. And they, I think that's the, Many, one of the many few things that the Islamic regi regime said, and they actually did what they said. They did not give me my certificate. So, uh, challenges from everywhere. We, my wife and I, were running um, a computer shop. They come and close and shut it down every single morning. We were go to our office and it was shut down. It was like uh, official paper on the door that you cannot open it come and pay a visit to this office and that office and we went and spent the all the whole day and by the end of the day they were saying oh we're sorry that was a mistake it was not you it was just something else oh sorry and then tomorrow it was another department come and shut it down seems like the the government doesn't necessarily always want to uh put you in jail but they want to make life impossible for you so the story that I'm hearing over and over again from just different people I've had the opportunity to talk to is you lose your education, your access to education, you lose your access to uh, your job, business, um, and you lose access to, to people around you, even just because of that fear, because you don't want to put them in danger, sure. or maybe people don't even want to relate to you anymore because they're, they're afraid that they'll also be persecuted yeah. in a similar in a similar way. They were monitoring us wherever we go. I went to pay a visit to my uncle's house one day, which he was not, and he still needs a Christian believer. After like about an hour after we left, he called me and said, I do really love you, but stop coming to my house. Immediately after you left, people call and ask me question. Is what was he doing there? Was mm -hmm. he talking about Christ? Was he trying to make a Christian? And he was like, he's just my, brother's son and you know he's just here but I, I don't I don't want this I don't want them to call me there's a lot to wrap your mind around here and I can't help but try to put myself in the shoes of Iranian believer imagine this for your own life you're born into a culture that values asking questions and searching for truth but at the same time into a religion that you are forced to practice and to reject it could mean losing your job, your family, your home, even your life. Following Jesus comes at a tremendous cost. There's no cultural or social advantage. It doesn't make life easier. But as we'll see in the next and final chapter of this series, following Jesus does make life with all of its pains and sorrows worth it. Wow, what a picture of the church.
in Iran in the past and in the present. So before we close this second session, I want us to do what we did at the start of this session. I want us to pray specifically for the church in Iran, for our sisters and brothers there. So again, either on your own or get in a group and you're going to see prayer points on the screen. And I want to invite you to pray according to them. So let's do that right now. Let's ask God, our Father, for His provision for our family in Iran. Go for it.
Oh God, our Father in heaven, we pray together for your provision for our family in Iran. We praise you for the history of faith at great cost there. And we pray that you would give our sisters and brothers their fresh faith today to follow you no matter what it costs them. And for us to do the same with them from wherever we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back together in a few minutes for one of the greatest revivals in the history of the world in Jonah chapter 3. So, see you in a bit. 